like to express our appreciation to President Faust and to Harvard for their generosity to a project which touches many of our hearts. Virginia Hackney was my dear friend. Born with intellectual disabilities, her life was a journey of purity and splendor, laughter and love, community and purpose. For many of us who loved her, including her parents and a sister who are with us today, losing her over three years ago to pancreatic cancer was a profound loss, but it was more. We also felt great inadequacy without knowledge or tools to help her understand all that was happening to her. What we realized is that the medical profession as a whole that lacks those skills and training and ideas that are not widely shared or simply don't yet exist to help intellectually disabled deal with their health, illness, and even end of life issues. Virginia was a spirited, active participant in life and never sat idly by on the sidelines. So in her tradition and her name today, we will begin a conversation. And we will hear from some of the top experts who have had the privilege to know and to work with the Virginias of the world. Now please welcome the new director of Harvard's Institute of Politics, Trey Grayson, who will launch our session. Thanks, Carolyn, for being such a fine fellow this semester, which has been one of our resident fellows at the IOP, uh, and also for putting together this, this great conversation. So on behalf of Harvard Center for Public Leadership, as well as the Institute of Politics, I want to welcome everybody to today's discussion. Uh, it's a pathbreaking discussion on health care and the intellectually disabled. Harvard's really proud to be able to provide a venue and support for such a vital public issue. We've got an extraordinary panel with us. They're going to share their insights and wealth of information about their years of service to this vulnerable population. We're very pleased to have Mr. Bob Johnson as our moderator this, evening, this afternoon. He's going to introduce the panel. Now, Mr. Johnson's been with the Special Olympics, involved with the Special Olympics for over 22 years, and is the current president and CEO of the organization in Massachusetts. He's devoted over 41 years to serve and improve the lives of those with intellectual disabilities. Prior to joining Special Olympics, he dedicated 19 years to serving children and adults with special needs through various capacities in public education. He was a special education teacher for six years, a special education administrator for nine years, and the Massachusetts Chief Compliance Officer for special education for four years. So after the panelists have spoke, each spoken, we'll open it up for question and answers. And we're always very informal here at Harvard, so by all means there's some cake, as we call it in Kentucky out there, I think it's turned so it's some fancy. <laughs> Feel free to go get your dessert, uh, get the refill and some drinks. Uh, the panelists will not be offended, and we're going to have a great afternoon. So, Mr. Johnson, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Some may logically be asking why the CEO of Special Olympics is moderating a health seminar. The reasons come back to one of our panelists here today, who I shall introduce in a moment. However, thanks to this individual, a man of great vision and determination, Special Olympics has become the world's foremost keeper of health-related data for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the world. As the world's largest amateur sports organization serving 3.5 million people with intellectual disabilities in over 171 countries, Special Olympics has access and has used that access and the power of sports to bring about great social change both here and far away. After today, I hope you will think of Special Olympics as more than a sports program. I hope you'll think of us as a health organization and a human rights organization dedicated to providing both children and adults with IVD better access to quality health care so that they can ultimately live not just a longer life, but a healthier, happier, longer life through sports. Over the course of the past 15 years, Special Olympics has collected some very interesting data, and I want to share some of that with you today to kind of set the stage. Some of the things that we know about people with intellectual disabilities we can learn from Special Olympics athletes. We know that Special, Special Olympics athletes, uh, 30, uh, of Special Olympics athletes, 33% see poorly and need new or different glasses. 6% 
have serious untreated eye disease. They, have a six they are six times more likely to fail a hearing test than the general population. They have 35% have obvious tooth decay in their molar teeth. 50% have obvious gum infections. 12% report being in pain. 15% require urgent care. 22% have bone loss. 65% are overweight or obese. 61% have foot problems or infections. They have a 40% greater risk of preventable secondary health conditions than do the general public. And they, are four times, they have four times more preventable mortality than the general population. But even with all of that, they receive only 2.7 medical visits compared to men of the general public who receive three, women who receive five, and children and elderly who receive six. 30 to 40 percent see specialists, while 92 percent have medical needs requiring special care. An adult today in the United States with intellectual disabilities has a 1 in 50 chance of finding a properly trained physician willing to accept them into their practice. That coupled with the life expectancy increase for people with intellectual disabilities that some say is as much as 26 years since the closing of the institutions back in the, back in the 70s. Their life expectancy is now estimated as high as 74. For people with Down syndrome, 57. This, ex this extended life expectancy brings with it a variety of unintended consequences, few of which have been dealt with in any systemic fashion. However, many are still seeing their pediatricians for things like cardiovascular disease, neurovascular disease, and testicular cancers. These facts are scandalous and contribute to the notion that people with intellectual disabilities continue to be the single most discriminated against segment of the population in the history of mankind. And that discrimination goes on today. I heard, recently heard a quote by one of our panelists, as a matter of fact, who simply stated, pain does not discriminate. The solutions to it do. Today we have with us four individuals who have vast experience in this field, each of whom bring a unique perspective to the issue we face. The first is Lucy Durhackney. Lucy Durhackney began her public service career as a founder of the Pennsylvania Partnership for Children, an advocacy organization devoted to health care for children. In this capacity, she devoted programs, I'm sorry, she developed programs to provide early screening immunizations, and family medical care to this vulnerable population. As a result of her work, Pennsylvania was the only state to inaugurate this benefit prior to the passage of the Child Health Insurance Program, CHIP. The Clinton administration modeled the CHIP statute on the Pennsylvania program. Mrs. Hackney actively served on the Board of Children's Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. Her association with Marion Wright Edelman Led her, led her successful involvement with federal legislation affecting children. Currently, Mrs. Hackney serves on the board of the, of the Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts Community Services, where she has been instrumental in designing projects related to drug rehab, mental health services, Head Start expansion, and domestic violence. Her vision and work for children and their families has been recognized throughout the United States. Mrs. Hackney attended Radcliffe College and received a BA from Princeton and a law degree from Tulane University. She is the magnificent mother of Virginia Hackney. <laughs> Next we have Dr. Stephen Gardner. Dr. Gardner is an internist at Massachusetts General Hospital and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is the past medical director of Special Olympics and for 12 years has been a volunteer physician at the Martha's Vineyard Cerebral Palsy Camp, Camp Jabberwocky the location and inspiration for many of his photographs. His photographs focus on the human spirit and specifically the resilience of people facing adversity and the compassion of those who care for them. It has been described by Dr. Carl Cooley of Dartmouth Medical School as, as a doctor, an artist who sees with his heart and has been awarded the Harvard Medical School Humanitarian, uh, human, I'm sorry, Humanism in Medicine Award in 2005. Third, we have Dr. Stephen Perlman, the gentleman I mentioned earlier. 
Dr. Perlman is, associate, is an associate clinical professor of pediatric dentistry at Boston University's Goldman School of Dental Medicine. He's devoted 30 years of his career, private practice, and teaching to the treatment of individuals with intellectual disabilities. He works with the Shriver family as they struggle to find adequate dental care for Rosemary Kennedy's sister to, U to U.S. President John F. Kennedy due to her intellectual disability. Dr. Perlman's concerns about health disparities highlighted by Rosemary Kennedy prompted the research and studies that launched the Special Smiles program from his Lynn Mass dentist office in 1993. The program later began the health, became the Healthy Athletes Program, <coughs> part of the Special Olympics Global Initiative to provide better health care and better quality of life for Special Olympics athletes. The Healthy Athletes Initiative is dedicated to providing health services and education to Special Olympics athletes and changing the way health systems interact with people with intellectual disability. Through free health screenings, trainings for health care professionals, and evaluations of, of the health status, Healthy Athletes has become a powerful public health organization worldwide. And finally, Dr. Sheldon Hackney. Dr. Hackney is Professor Emeritus of U.S. History at the University of Pennsylvania. He specialized in the history of the American South since the Civil War. Out of his interest in American utopias and other social movements come an emphasis on the Civil Rights Movement in particular and the 1960s in general, which he frequently pursues in seminars. He is at work on a biography of C. Van Woodward, the noted historian of the American South. Among the articles and books on history that Professor Hackney has published, Populism to Progressivism in Alabama won the Albert J. Beveridge Award of the American Historic Association. Magnolias Without Moonlight is a collection of his, his historical essays. Professor Hackney is the former president of Tulane University, the University of Pennsylvania, and the former chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. He has written and spoken widely about higher education, national cultural policy, and the state of the humanities in American life. He is also the author, author of Following Virginia, the story of Virginia Hackney's inspirational story. Our plan now is to have brief presentations, five to seven minutes, by each of our panelists, and then to open uh, the discussion up for questions and answers. And we'll begin with, with Dr. Lucy Hackney. Uh, Lucy, uh, can I start? Please? Sure. This, this is the book that was just mentioned. I think Lucy is going to read um, a segment from it. <clears throat> I'll start one copy going around this way. Just look at it to see what it is. It, it is a chronicle of Virginia's last year, basically. Well, before I start <coughs> talking about um, what I was going to read, I just want to um, say a little bit about not what I did in the past, but. Um, the fact that um, when Virginia was born, um, I had no idea she had disabilities, and I had, I have to say, a really stupid doctor um, who I, I think <laughs> did, didn't do that. very well. Um, and, um, uh, but she was amazing, and Dr. Spock was always wonderful because he kept saying, don't worry, don't worry, 18 months she'll um, be willing to finally get up and walk and all of that. And so I had the amazing experience of having Virginia as my child, having absolutely no idea that she had disabilities. So um, it was partly my ignorance of being very young. Um, I got married uh, right after I finished uh, the first last two years of Radcliffe when Southern girls did that kind of thing. And, um, and um, as far as I was concerned, Virginia was just wonderful. And it wasn't um, until my sister, my older sister, who um, knows a lot more than I do about psychology and so on, and I, um, she took care of my uh, Virginia briefly while Sheldon and I went off to New York City one time, uh, for a weekend. And she came back and she said, I think I have something wrong with Virginia. And I said, what is that? And she said, well, the way she uses her arm. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, when she picks up things, she goes like this, but for um, children, um, normal children, they pick up like this. And I was stunned. I said, well, that's really interesting. And it turned out, as I began to talk to doctors, that she 
um, did have a range of disabilities. Um, but uh, it was wonderful for me to know that for 18 months, I, didn't, I just loved her so much, and I had no idea that there was any disability at all. So it's good to be an ignorant mother sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I, uh, I'm, Sheldon's going to talk a lot about her past. But one of the things that people don't think much about is what it's like to have a sister who has a disability. Um, or, uh, uh, or um, one of uh, it, it, it is one of her one of her siblings, and um, we have friends here who has a child with disabilities that's known Virginia forever, and there are so many. And there is my daughter Lucy. Uh, um, Elizabeth, <laughs> right there. <laughs> That's right. She just came in. Um, but there's so many people here that I just want to say are friends of ours who've known Virginia, and I guess about 50% of you have, have known Virginia over the years. Um, but I wanted to really talk um, ab about Elizabeth, um, and when Virginia died, Elizabeth did the most amazing piece talking about what it was like to be the sister of a, a child with a, 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 a sister with a disability. And if I cry, it's okay because um, it's, and Elizabeth may cry as well, because we haven't, but here it is, um, Elizabeth was speaking at the church. Um, Virginia was not a typical big sister. We did not share clothes. She did not teach me how to wear makeup or to do the latest dance craze. She did not give me advice on boys. On the other hand, she did introduce me to her favorite music. You know, the classics like David Cassidy, John Denver, and the songs from Greece, and so forth. I loved it. Although she didn't teach me the typical big sister stuff, I did learn some very important lessons from her. Virginia always watched out for me. There is a family story from the time I came home from the hospital as a newborn. I was three weeks early and, my very, and very small. Virginia was almost six years old then. My parents were entertaining guests when Virginia appeared in the room in her nightgown carrying me. She had managed to get me out of the crib and carry me into the dining room where my me mother sat aghast, terrified that I would be dropped and hurt. My father managed to calmly procure um, me with, from Virginia's loving grasp without showing her any sign of the panic he felt. Um, this was the beginning of the special relationship between Virginia and me. She was the big sister and she meant to take care of me. There were times, however, that I felt the need to take care of her. From the very young age, I learned the importance <coughs> of looking out for the little guy. Sometimes I was with Virginia when she was teased by native bu uh, bullies, naive bu bullies. I loved her, and I learned to stand up for her. My brother Fane had more than his share of playground brawls protecting her at school. I learned while young that despite the sassy retort, six, and sto six sticks and stones may break my bones, but the world never hurt me, words really can hurt. And besides learning that, it is right to protect that those who cannot necessarily protect themselves, I learn to be a sensitive always to people's feelings. Although I never really knew how often my sister was taunted, I did learn recently that she did indeed have the ability to stick up for herself. The story goes, as told by Virginia, that she was taking a long time to pay for her bagel in one of her favorite uh, breakfast haunts. The bagel authority, when a homeless man behind her had started mumbling about how long is it for you to take, uh, get what you want, and called her some nasty names. This apparently was not the first time he had bothered her. Well, according to Virginia, she turned around and told him that she had a disability that made her a little slow, but what excuse did he have for being homeless? <laughs> <laughs> this is how she told the story anyway. I have to say it made me quite proud. Maybe all these years she could have stood up for herself. That might have saved fame several black eyes. Virginia also taught me kindness. Besides the typical childhood roughhousing, noogies, dead legs, <laughs> Indian burns, pinching, and finger pen pending, I can't recall a time in my life when we argued or said unkind things to each other. We weren't the kind of siblings to hurt each other's feelings because we knew about teasing firsthand. And she wasn't just nice to her brother and sister. Virginia always had been kind to everyone, young, old, white, black, 
physically challenged, mentally challenged. She loved everyone. She gave everyone an equal chance to her affection. And you can bet that if she does not like someone, there was a darn good reason. I've tried to be just as embracing of all kinds of people throughout my life. Virginia also taught me that it, it's far better to give them to to give than to receive. When she gave a present, she expected a hug, a kiss, and a thank you letter in the mail. Virginia loved giving presents. I'm sure that many of you have been recipients of her generosity. Last Christmas, when Virginia was under treatment for pancreatic cancer, we knew it would probably be her last Christmas. Maybe she knew it too, because she decided that instead of usual black dog merchandise that she habitually handed out as gifts, she would do something a bit more personal. She decided to knit scarves for people. On Christmas morning, she gave out the scarves, and it turned out she had inadvertently forgotten a couple of people in the family, and they jokingly gave her a hard time about it. She took this to heart. The next day, lo and behold, she showed up with two newly knitted scarves for the previously forgotten family members. One of them was barely long enough to wrap around the neck, and the other was long enough to wrap around probably five <laughs> times. But she had done it and in a very little time, too. These scarves had become reminders in my family of the generosity of Virginia. Patience, of course, was another virtue that I learned through living with Virginia. Sitting at the family dinner table, was the occasion that put patience in the ultimate test. As you can imagine, dinner at the Hackney House when we were growing up was never really a child-friendly affair. My parents always had heated discussions about the latest political situation, and they talked about interesting books they'd read. There was hardly any gossip or news that a child might find interesting. Fane and I bore those dinners um, for years and years, and finally, at age 25, <coughs> we were savvy enough to participate in dinner conversation. Virginia, however, was doomed to a lifetime of family dinners with long dinners, especially during holiday meals that went on even longer. Virginia took after her namesake, her grandmother Virginia Durr, as well as her mother in terms of social skills. I tried to learn from her. I've always been very shy. and. Um, Virginia has always pushed me to be more outgoing. As you can imagine, it was hard to blend into the background with Virginia at your side introducing you to every passerby on Main Street. It wasn't always clear how she knew someone, but she seemed to know an awful lot of people. She not only knew a lot of people, she also knew the nicest ones. In the past four weeks, I have met some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. They are all friends and fans of Virginia, Fane and I always joked that she got all the social genes, and he and I were left with inability to recognize even our best friends in the grocery store. <laughs> this past week, watching Virginia struggle against cancer, I have learned important lessons of courage and strength. She kept going about her daily schedule despite feeling tired and weak. The day before she died, she attempted lunch at Black Dog and later instructed us in how to fold the church programs for Sunday services. She was completely exhausted. No matter, at 5 o'clock in the middle of her short snooze, she opened one eye, glanced at her watch, and announced it's time to go to choir practice. Um, but she was, uh, I thought, I, I put, I'm putting my foot down this time. No way she can have any, enough strength to go to the choir practice, but she was stubborn. She was now about to be told by her little sister what she could and could not do. Virginia was the best big sister God could have given me. She taught by example, and I tried to follow her lead. She taught me kindness, patience, acceptance, generosity, and she tried her best to teach me proper social skills. In her last day, she showed me her courage and strength. I am a better person for having known her, and I am the luckiest girl in the world to have her as my sister. What a wonderful perspective. Isn't that just great? Uh, Dr. Gardner. I feel like I'm a better person for knowing her, too. <laughs> I mean, in fact, I know I am. And you didn't cry, so I won't cry. <laughs> but um, I'm also the dad of a, a young man with a disability, so I have that perspective, too. And I'd probably start out by, <laughs> by saying that almost everything valuable that I've learned in my life came from someone like Virginia or someone like my son or the people who assist them. And to put that in sort of Shakespearean terms, you might say the quality of mercy is twice blessed and droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven on the place beneath, and is not strained 
and it blesseth both the one who gives and the one who receives. And I've seen that over and over again at the Special Olympics. I've seen it over and over again at Camp Jabberwocky. Uh, and I've marveled at both the people with disabilities and the people caring for them, uh, at the joy they find in that experience and what they exchange. Um, if I may, I'll just follow up on Lucy's remark with one quick anecdote about Virginia and my son, Graham. Uh, Virginia adored Graham uh, and never failed to compliment him on how handsome he was. Each year, she brought Graham a present, typically from the black dog, typically a trendy black dog t-shirt, and that happened without fail. Graham could count on receiving a colorful new shirt with the famous Labrador Retriever logo before leaving camp. When Virginia became ill, however, for the first time, a camp session passed without Graham seeing Virginia. We were consumed by the frenetic pace of camp, as we usually are, and we didn't give it too much thought. Until a few weeks later, back at home, a package arrived from the vineyard, and there was a royal blue t-shirt from the black dog. We had heard by then about Virginia's cancer, and we reached her by phone at the condo where she still lived with fierce independence on Main Street in Vineyard Haven. Virginia, we're awfully sorry to hear about your diagnosis. How are you? Me? Don't worry, I'm doing fine. How did Graham like his t-shirt? <laughs> um, so uh, I think a good society, the mark of a good society, is its willingness to take all of us along on the ride. And I think we are a good society, and I think we, we are trying to do that. We need to get better at doing that. Um, let me just mention a couple of general problems that, that relate to this issue of intellectual disability and access to proper care. Uh, one of them, one of those issues is that it's hard to get primary care no matter who you are, whether you're able-bodied or otherwise. There's a shortage of primary care here and everywhere, and it's a, that's a complicated subject, probably a subject for another day. Uh, I'm lucky to be at Mass General, where I can proudly say that for the last 200 years, the doors have been open to everyone, and no one gets turned away at the door. Um, but that's not true everywhere. Um, so access to care is a general problem, and access to care for people with disabilities is a, is a subset of that and a, a serious issue. Um, I wonder what's going to happen to us if we continue to do better at helping people with cancer and disease. So if the Jimmy Fund is more and more successful, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and all the other places around the country and the world that are improving care for cancer, and we at the same time, we help people with heart disease by controlling their cholesterol, diet, their diabetes, their blood pressure, their weight, and get them to quit smoking. What will we do if our life expectancy in America ends up being 90 or 95 or even 100 someday? We better be prepared to deal with uh, people with cognitive impairment. And you know, right now, we're, we're not prepared. Um, and I don't, you know, don't pretend to know the answer to that, but I think, you know, a discussion like this, uh, you know, begins to help us uh, try to sort that out, at least to, to, to begin thinking about it. Um, I was awfully lucky to know Virginia. Um, I w all of us in medicine have patients where we feel at the end of the visit that they gave us more than we gave them, and Virginia was absolutely one of those people. Thank you. Dr. Perlman? Well, thank you for having me. And, and Caroline, if, I apologize to the group, but get, getting seven minutes to talk about a lifetime of work and the most exciting things that I've ever done are happening now. And for the first time, I'm going to present a consensus statement that I and my colleagues have been working on. And I think I'm going to nail this whole thing about health care for people with intellectual disabilities if I'm allowed to read it. But first of all, so health disparities, by definition, health disparities, so I apologize for reading, but I got seven minutes. 
Health, I have adult ADD and I gotta stay focused. <laughs> health disparities are differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, burden of diseases, and other adverse health conditions or outcomes <clears throat> that exist among specific population groups in the United States. For example, Hispanics are twice as likely to die from diabetes. Tuberculosis strikes Asian Americans at 16 times the rates of whites. Cancer kills 35% more African Americans than whites. If two patients have similar heart disease, a black patient is one-third less likely to undergo life-saving bypass surgery than a white patient. And among preschool children hospitalized for asthma, only 7% of black and 2% of Hispanic children compared to 21% of white children are prescribed routine medications to prevent future asthma-related hospitalizations. Among women with physical disabilities, uh, more than six times are likely to experience depression, more than five times are more likely to have diabetes, are more than five times likely to have osteoporosis, are twice as likely to be obese, and nearly twice as much will suffer from hypertension. And now, for the first time ever, uh, I would like to present a health disparities consensus statement that several years ago, the work that I was doing with Special Olympics got, um, I started to get calls from physicians all over the country and dentists that we needed an organization of specialists that really dealt with people with intellectual disabilities and uh, a, a true organization of experts. And we've been working on a consensus on statement on health disparities for the past few months, and we have finally got it, and I'd like to just talk about it today, and I think I'm going to nail every point that needs to be addressed. I'm going to talk about two issues. What are the most important facts that we know about health disparities in people with intellectual and dis developmental disabilities, and the most important actions that can be now done to improve the situation? The most important facts we know about healthcare disparities in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. People with neurodevelopmental intellectual disabilities are a unique and medically distinct population by virtue of genetic, biologic, developmental, and environmental factors that are the etiologic cause of their disability. Thanks in large part to decades of healthcare advocacy and specialization in the field of pediatrics. Coupled with advances in medical care, people with intellectual disabilities are living longer with life expectancies in many cases that mirror those of the neurotypical population. People with intellectual disabilities consistently face challenges, challenges finding clinicians that are trained to treat them within a healthcare system that has no mandate nor model to treat them with the degree of excellence expected for all other conditions which impact health. The majority of physicians and dentists have limited knowledge regarding the health and psychosocial needs of this population, primarily due from a lack of exposure and training. Clinicians, as is true within society, often harbor limiting attitudes towards individuals with intellectual disabilities and contribute to the stigmatization and marginalization that often defines their healthcare experience. As a result, this population does not, in general, receive appropriate health promotion, preventive screenings, surveillance, or an approach to evaluation and management of health conditions consistent with that provided the neurotypical population. Patients with intellectual disabilities are rarely included in mainstream clinical trials and research efforts. Therefore, almost nothing is known regarding their suitability response or the clinical effectiveness of standard or emerging treatment protocols and guidelines. This severity hinders our ability to develop <coughs> evidence-based or best practice approaches to care that increasingly defines the practice of medicine in the 21st century. Patients with intellectual disability are not adequately transitioned from pediatric to adult-focused care nor based on the prematuring aging and medical conditions frequently associated with their disability to timely geriatric focused care. The majority of newly graduated physicians, despite an interest in patients with intellectual disabilities, do not feel competent to treat this category of patients. 
beyond this personal commitment, there are very few opportunities or incentives to receive pre- or postgraduate competency-based training. Despite decades of reports calling for changes in physician training and systems of care, and despite pockets of excellence across the country where quality care is a priority, there are no comprehensive <coughs> national plan has been articulated or enacted to address these shortcomings. There is compelling evidence that people with intellectual disabilities are medically underserved. The United States Surgeon General reported on these health barriers and disparities, and yet, beyond, uh, despite meeting the government's own definition of medically underserved population, HRSA does not recognize people with intellectual disabilities as qualifying for this designation. designation rather. Minority patients with intellectual disabilities often experience ethnicity-related disparities in addition to those of their disability-specific condition. The lack of disability-related culturally competent care frequently compounds the challenges already faced by Hispanic and African-American populations. Bob, do we have time for solutions? Solutions? I mean, for uh, what are the most important things that could be done to improve the situation? Do we have two minutes? Go for it. <laughs> people, with in, people with intellectual disabilities should be formally recognized as constituting a medically underserved population by HRSA and other appropriate federal agencies and receive the consideration, the benefits, the opportunities, and the assistance provided to this population with that designation. This designation, as well as the unmet healthcare needs of this population, should be acknowledged by established medical and dental organizations to address health disparities. Medical, dental, nursing, and allied health education curricula should include didactic and clinical opportunities for students to develop an understanding and appreciation of the unique qualities and rich opportunities possible for individuals with intellectual disability. These curricula should be designed to raise awareness, stimulate interest, and support developing not only clinical competence, but also skill in healthcare advocacy for patients, their families, and their caregivers. Healthcare providers should establish, formulate, recognize, disseminate, and adopt clinical guidelines, protocols, and best practices related to the health promotion, disease prevention, and specific treatment needs of patients with intellectual disabilities. In addition to intellectual disability specific core scientific and medical knowledge, education of healthcare professionals should include knowledge of the movement towards community-based living, education, employment, socialization, person-centered planning, self-determination and quality health care that reflects the desired experience of this population. People with intellectual <clears throat> disabilities have both the right and natural inclination to live in typical settings in our community. Many need accommodation supports and resources to do so successfully. Physicians, dentists, and other health care providers in their role as health care advocates should strive with the same vigor and commitment as their vocational calling to facilitate and encourage this in a manner that fully honors the civil and human rights of individuals with intellectual disabilities, and above all else, commits to health parity and their highest quality of life as possible. The de discipline of developmental medicine should be established with all the requisite components that define a specific and unique body of medical knowledge, expertise, and training. Specialists in this discipline would be trained to provide educational, research, and consultative roles while providing leadership in discipline and system of care delivery. These specialists would complement the role of the primary care medical home and support substantially subspecialty sub care physicians in their role of providing quality care to persons with intellectual disabilities in the same manner that they provide for their <coughs> neurotypical patients. Compensation and reimbursement for healthcare professionals should be amended to reflect the additional training, time, special accommodations, and care coordination demands that are required to provide specialized care for this unique population. 
I apologize for reading and going so fast, but it was a lot of material, and I think a lot of people have been helping me, a lot of people have been working on this, and like I said, this is the first time that it's ever been presented in a public forum, but I think we nailed a lot of the points. I think you sure did. I think it's a, it's a sad commentary on our society when our goal is to bring this population to the level of underserved. I got to tell you that we've been, I've been working for the last, on this medically underserved issue, trying to get it before Congress. The government has four guidelines to declare, right now it's done by race, and, uh, you know, ethnicity and zip code, and it's infant mortality, percentage of population over the age of 65, percentage of population in poverty, and number of primary care physicians per 1,000 people. That's the government's own formula for a medically underserved population. For the ID population, infant mortality rates are the highest in the nation. Only 10% of ID population lives beyond the age of 65, and 33% of this population live in poverty. Startling statistics, yeah. thank you. Dr. Hackney. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm coming actually, I, I <laughs> thought that was fantastic. I'll come back to it in a minute and change what I was going to say, but let me say first how wonderful it is to see so many old friends here, and old friends of Virginia uh, here in the room, especially, well, no, not especially, and, but including the president of Harvard, that's very nice, <laughs> you, Virginia, also uh, back in the past, and I, I must say that I'm really delighted to see these blue t-shirts. They, not that your t-shirts are bad, but <laughs> there, there was a, a solid phalanx of t-shirts. This is a, a new organization that is promoting the, the need for public attention to the question of autism in particular, but it, everything you said would also um, be appropriate for, for your goals. This event, indeed, may be one little uh, instance that starts a national conversation about uh, children and adults with disabilities of various kinds and how the society has to pay closer attention to them and do something uh, to allow them to live a, a more productive life. And those, those principles, this event, and your efforts, if it spreads, would be just, just fantastic. But that reminds me also of the fact that Virginia was born in 1958, um, in the middle of what I call the 1960s, the 60s, as it were. Now, the 60s, to me, are a decade of 20 years, going from the Brown decision in 1954 to the resignation of Richard Nixon in 1974. That period was a time when I, uh, it was maybe kicked off by the Civil Rights Movement, uh, uh, promoting the rights of African Americans in particular, but other minority groups as well. But it begins with the Civil Rights Movement as such, and then spreads. Uh, you will recall this is when the, the, uh, the new phase, the modern phase of the women's rights movement uh, gets kicked off in the early 60s. The lesbian gay uh, movement uh, gets uh, kicked off in the late uh, 1960s. Uh, um, and the student movement, or just the, uh, the radical left movement in general for remaking society gets kicked off too, as well as the anti-war movement in the 1960s. Now one of the interesting things about these social movements that have a cause, such as the one that you're promoting, is that mm, they, they begin frequently with a rather modest uh, goal, and they attract people who come into the movement to accomplish that goal, those people who come into the movement bring with them other goals, if you will, other values. So the movement um, not only gets uh, is successful, but it begins to add elements to it, uh, belief elements, values, if you will. It is also likely to be successful, and success makes the movement increase its goals uh, to change society, and pretty soon you get a reaction from society against those increased goals, if you will, and that's uh, what happened in the 1960s, and that reaction 
uh, give you an example, the anti-war movement was extremely successful. The anti-war sentiment in the United States went up dramatically in 1967-68, but also the anti-anti-war sentiment went up at that time, which means the public uh, came to not like the war, to think that it was a huge mistake, but they came to also criticize the anti-war movement. That's uh, sort of typical of social movements in general. Virginia benefited from the fact that she was living at a time when public awareness of various conditions, including disabilities, eventually in the, in the 1970s, that was, uh, was increasing, and the general social values that support a society which, uh, which uh, you know, supports people and provides opportunities for them to live as normal a life as possible, as independent a life as possible, was growing uh, by leaps and bounds in, the, in that enhanced uh, decade of the 1960s. We need another such uh, period which I think your consensus statement and goals uh, enunciated very, very clearly. So maybe uh, that's possible. For my wife and me, the experience with Virginia was dramatic uh, and changed our lives uh, in, in fundamental ways. We early came to the conclusion that our goal for her w would be, uh, should be, to try to see that she could lead as independent a life as possible. That was the goal, and that became her goal as well. Uh, it, and it, it sort of, it worked. She eventually, well, she e exhausted the public education system in Princeton, New Jersey, where we were at the time, and had to go somewhere else. We, uh, Lucy, my political wife, uh, figured out how to get the state of Pennsylvania to pay some of the tuition for a boarding school for uh, children with disabilities. So Virginia went to Elwin Institute in the suburbs of Philadelphia, which was a great experience for her. Their emphasis was on making sure that she not only could read and write, <coughs> which she could do at about a third grade level, but that she knew how to ride the bus, how to go to the bank, how to do all sorts of things in life that would allow her to live independently. And, uh, and then we, when she came out of Elwyn, we were living, we were in New Orleans then, and she made the decision to go back to Princeton and live by herself, actually with a roommate, housemate, and she did. Now that, and we got involved also in establishing an organization in Princeton that would support children with disabilities. Uh, that she worked. was a grown up by then. <laughs> That's true, she was. <laughs> That's, uh, she was. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon, yes, uh, she that that worked very well. She lived independently there. She held some jobs uh, there. Then she eventually decided to move to Martha's Vineyard, which is where our summer home was and where she felt very much at home, and which is a community that is sensitive to people who have special needs. And she fit right in. And as you've heard. In, and various people saying she was an unusual person in that she was outgoing and friendly and got to know all sorts of people. The vineyard worked for her and because it was the sort of society that we need America to be, that is a society which uh, cultivates and protects its, all of its members equally and provides opportunities for them and can fix the problems that are, that are there. That's where what we need to be working toward. So. Uh, the the uh, the vineyard Martha's Vineyard experience for Virginia was very successful, and maybe we can do something to create a similar spirit of community throughout the country. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> can I just follow up on that, Tom? Certainly. So I watched you know Virginia for a number of years down on the island of Martha's Vineyard, and it began to teach me that not only did Virginia benefit from being embraced by that community, but that community benefited from em embracing Virginia. Yeah. And the whole place became better, more inclusive, uh, more diverse, more fun, a stronger place, uh, a more wonderful place. So it worked both ways. 
Absolutely, yeah. And I, as you can imagine, I, I have an opportunity in my line of work to interact with, obviously, many people with intellectual disabilities, but also with their families. And I have never heard a family member tell me anything other than that their child was a blessing. And that their child, they not only learned a great deal from their child, but their child has enhanced their lives in ways that a neurotypical child might never have never have done so. I think uh, one of the things that we heard today in the, is several perspectives uh, uh, from, from parents, from friends, from siblings, of people with intellectual disabilities, and what they all talked about is how much we learn from them and what a gift they are. We couple that with what we look at now as a, as a rather uh, dramatically extended life expectancy for people with intellectual disabilities. And we'd like to think that that too is a gift. But I think we selfishly define that as a gift for us, not for them. Some of them might tell you it's not a gift, it's an extended sentence. Because the life I have is not one that most people would want to continue any longer. The health disparities that, that Steve has mentioned and some of the statistics that I mentioned are, are difficult for us to perceive in, in our society today. One of the things that we've learned, I think, over all of us having 30 or 40 years of experience with this population is that change is not revolutionary, it's evolutionary. And that things are continuing to happen and a great deal of wonderful work has been done over the course of the last 40 years and probably more progress for this population has been made in the last 40 years than prior to that in the history of mankind. Our challenge is to keep it, keep it moving. When I present to my young staff and I look over at these young folks over here and I say, don't sit on your laurels. Don't allow anybody to tell you that the work is done because it isn't. Your obligation now is to bring about the same amount of change in half the time. And that's every generation's responsibility. Our athletes, people with intellectual disabilities, are counting on us. Many of them can't fight for themselves. They're counting on us. Unlike other discriminated uh, against uh, segments of our society, they don't have the power to rise up. We have to rise up for them. And your consensus statement, I think, uh, is a great step, great step forward. I hope it's embraced. And I hope that in our lifetime, my lifetime, not yours, my lifetime, <laughs> I hope that we can raise them to the level of underserved so that they finally get service because right now they are unserved, not underserved. Open it up for some, some questions, comments. Uh, please feel free. Just Give me a high sign, yes. Um, first of all, good afternoon. Um, my name is Courtney Thomas, and I'm a second year Master of Public Policy student here. Um, and as someone whose reason for coming to the Kennedy School was to make a difference in disability advocacy and policy, it's really a delight um, for me to be here today with y'all. And um, my question relates to um, gaining allies and support for the rights and needs of persons with disabilities. Um, my older brother Tinsley uh, is severely autistic and is nonverbal. And so for me, it's always been second nature that, of course, I care about um, the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, and as, as the, because of my parents' expectations that I would be his legal guardian, I've been a lifelong advocate for him. Um, but I found that what's been surprising to me is that the rights of persons with disabilities is not something obvious to everyone. Right. Um, and so the, I'm just, I would just like to know uh, what have been your experiences of uh, um, getting the rights of such a marginalized population, um, getting people who may have never thought about, you know, what about persons with disabilities? How do you engage? I wonder if I could begin on that one. Uh, the, uh, I, I had the pleasure of speaking to about 1,200 uh, high school students a month or so ago. And as, uh, as I was walking up to the stage, I realized that 
I'm exactly 45 years older than the oldest person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked out, looked out at that crowd and I said, you know, unfortunately, uh, it's my generation that's running things. And my generation grew up not having an opportunity to interact largely with people with intellectual disabilities, therefore not appreciating, not understanding, not respecting them. And as I sit across the table now from people that I'm seeking funds from to support our efforts, I hear their words, but I can see in their eyes they still don't care. The good news is my generation isn't going to be running things much longer. Yours is. And that's what's going to make the difference. Because you've grown up understanding, respecting, and interacting with people with intellectual disabilities, and you are willing to share your rights with them. And my generation was not. Just a specific thing on autism. Um, so at Mass General, the, the pediatricians take care of kids with autism, and then they turn a certain age, and there's a sort of a void out there. So uh, a few months ago, the pediatricians came to us in adult medicine and said, could you do something about that? And so we took a baby step by agreeing each one of us in primary care to, to take one autistic young man or young woman into our practices, even though most of them were closed. Most, most primary care practices are closed these days. So that's a small step in one area of, area of autism where at least the, the kids coming up through pediatrics will be able to continue good medical care into adulthood through, through primary care. So if that is an example that we can apply to other uh, disorders or conditions, then we'll be, we'll be making some progress. Hopefully. Did you offer special training for these um, internists, for these primary care doctors? Mm, um, no, I mean, not specifically, but um, I mean, I, since I've worked m more with people with disabilities, I let people know that they were welcome to c contact me if they, if they needed some assistance. But most people were happy to do that. Um, and in our, in an academic setting like that, it's usually not hard to find assistance from somebody skilled in a particular area via email or paging or cell phones, whatever it might be. Our research tells us that 93% 90, of medical, medical school deans will tell you that there is nothing in their curriculum to prepare them to treat people with intellectual disabilities. And 85% of graduating physicians have indicated a willingness and an interest in serving the population. You see the gap? Pretty clear. Uh, sir. Sir, I'm um, I'm a Jason Israel. I'm a second year Master in Public Policy student. Um, thank you so much. And actually, just on that topic, I heard in Dr. Pullman's consensus statement, um, they discussed that the, the number of people that were graduating from medical schools, I don't remember the exact number, sir, but it was low, of uh, people that have any uh, preparation for serving this population. You used the word incentives, right, a word that we use often here in public policy. What are, what are some of the public policy incentive gaps that we're seeing and specific initiatives that we, you know, we're writing policy papers every day about incentives, right? And to be yeah. able to make recommendations to senior officials. And I'm kind of looking yeah. at how would I create incentives to, to make, <coughs> to nudge some of the graduates from medical schools into some of these programs? Well, designating, for one thing, the, the, why we've been pushing so hard on this medically underserved population. For example, when you graduate any health profession school, you can get loan repayment by working in, you know, everybody's got huge debts growing, uh, from finishing these programs. If you, you can work in a Native American uh, reservation and get huge loan repayment, you can work in an African American or Hispanic health center and get loan repayment. But let's say you wanted to work in the field of special patient care uh, in, in a developmental center or something to help. There's no loan repayment. They're not a designated medically underserved population, so there's no no there's no loan repayment. So that's a huge disincentive. See the connection there. Second of all, research in the schools. They want to create. Let's say, you know, uh, Harvard wants to start a uh, program for developmental medicine. Well, if you want to study fetal alcohol syndrome in, Af in Native Americans or. Uh, uh, hypertension in African Americans. Yes, they're medically underserved population. You can. You want to do anything in the field of people with intellectual disabilities or disabilities. They're not declared a medically underserved population. 
so there's no funding for any of these programs. You want to hire faculty. See, the two biggest problems that we've had in education, in, in professional schools, A, there's no faculty to, tr to train people, no trained faculty, and B, the schools don't make any money on this population because they're largely, like I said, 33% live in poverty. So they're working on a Medicaid system, and the Medicaid reimbursements are so pathetic in, in almost every state now. In, uh, in Massachusetts, they're dropping adult care. We've always been one of the leaders in, in, in care, in, in dentistry. So no, no faculty <coughs> available, no money for the schools to make, and the schools should actually be the safety net for the community, right? You know? So huge. We tried to push, we tried to push, in the Council on Dental Accreditation, uh, it, it had been inadvertently taken out. Schools had no responsibility in training anybody about healthcare for people with intellectual disabilities. We thought that this was an oversight because it had been in and not. So we petitioned the schools. We lost 30 to nothing to insert it in the curriculum. 30 to nothing. We figured it was a mistake. Took it again to a vote. It got killed again. And only when we said we were going public did we get it passed, and only the most watered-down version, that a graduate has to be competent in the diagnosis, no treatment involved, just in the diagnosis of a problem. Just a quick follow-up on that. So just going back to primary care for a minute, we all know that we have these constricted periods of time in which to see patients, like 15-minute visits. And most of us in primary care you know, sort of cringe when we see a senior person in the lobby with a problem list of 15 serious issues. And we know that it takes them 14 minutes just to undress, <laughs> leaving you one minute to address all those problems. So to take on somebody that you know will, will cost you more time, even though you may be well-intentioned and really want to do that, you have to somehow, we, we have to find some way of creating an incentive for people to do that who are already maximally busy. And I don't, I don't honestly know the answer. I mean, we tried to, we use this example of the autistic folks at Mass General, each person taking one, agreeing to take one person, that was a start. But that's just a start uh, within a much bigger problem. Yeah. Sir. Um, I'm Davis Weinstock, I'm uh, a friend of Virginia. Soul distinction. Um, the, um, it's a, a very cacophonous market with a, a lot of competition for causes that need attention. I mean, my earliest memories of going to the movie as a seven year old or whatever, but immediately with the end of after World War II was the lights went on and a, a little thing was passed around for infant, the March of Dimes for infant top paralysis and, and we had just come off of uh, well I think somebody four times who uh, suffered from that illness and, and uh, had died two years before was still uh, was still missed and attention was paid and uh, fewer organizations were fighting for the uh, public dollar and the eventual work by Dr. Salk and others that led to, uh, in, in that case, prevention. Um, this you know, came as an enormous amount of money translated into today's terms an awful lot of public sentiment and attention. In a, in a uh, political climate today that I, I, uh, I work in politics, but I would welcome anyone else who could define the political climate today because I couldn't. Um, and, uh, and what the 24-7 the, uh, the news cycle that's global and with the competition for attention and dollars, uh, you know, have there been ideas, you know, the statement's very helpful and 
consolidating and statistics help um, working as a number of us do here with the Du Bois Institute, we see statistics that don't surprise us but shock us and uh, in, a, in a different area. Are there to go to Congress and to get this designated, I understand the practical as an underserved a aspect of, of uh, uh, medical attention. I, I understand the practicality of that, the incentivizing of doctors. As far as public awareness is concerned, autism was brought to the Children's Defense Fund when you were serving with brought it there at that time, and, and, and uh, Hillary Clinton was on that board with you at that time. I believe that it, that not much happened. How do you galvanize a public attention around uh, the issue of cognitive impairment, around the problems and costs in medical service, because without a wellspring of, of uh, sentiment, particularly now with you know crazy people not only having been elected to office but being catered to, um, where uh, I'm not sure anybody could really define why the political party in, in, with any commonality. I, I wonder how anybody has any thoughts that because I don't would welcome uh, plans afoot to galvanize this on a broader basis. I. I I, this sounds like um, I don't. I don't mean to be that. You know, everything is getting better. But when I think about Virginia, um, this is 50 years ago. Past 50 years ago, um, there were no. There was no education. No public education for uh, kids with disabilities. There, uh, the um, people had enough money. Um, were immediately um, taken, those children were taken off and never to often see their, their um, siblings. I mean, the Arthur Miller case is one that we all, probably many of us have read, you know, the, the child, here he was liberal in every way, working for good things. His own child was basically immediately taken off to a place for somebody to take care of him the rest of his life. Um, that was, in, and Sheldon and I, when, Shel when Virginia was um, uh, getting ready to go get um, elementary school, um, the question was um, where could we find some place for her to do something that would help? And I cannot tell you how many places we went to, so as to be fine people that had lots of, you know, people who had enough money to help to go to these places, and they would say, "Oh, darling, well, we will take her for the rest of your life, so you can be, um, she can be taken care of." And I said, "That is not what I want. Goodbye." I mean, it went over, and I must have done that. We must have done that three or four times with tears and <laughs> Sheldon, but. But there has been a tremendous amount of change since those 50 years. It's that there's still so much more to happen. There's Virginia skating, and that was because of the, what you've been working for, and there she is, and she loved every minute of it, and it, it was huge for her. There's so many places that have things that have happened, and now we just need to do much more. It, but it, it isn't, it, we can't, be dismal. We've got to go move on because there's just a lot to do. I think it largely does come back to, to the fact that for many years people with intellectual disabilities were hidden away. They were. And the, Completely. As a result, there was so little awareness yeah. of them. And uh, uh, today that's very different. I, I can tell you, I was uh, telling Steve Perlman earlier, you know, when obviously when, when I was in school, there were no people with intellectual disabilities in our school. That's right. When my kids went to school, they encountered them in middle school, junior high, high school. Yesterday, my 10-month-old grandson had a swimming lesson with a little girl with Down syndrome. It's working. It's happening. But we've got a long, long way to go. Long, long way to go. Yeah. And yeah. we can't sit back. As I said earlier, I hate to point at you guys again, but 
you know, your, your level of awareness, your level of respect and, and understanding of people with intellectual disabilities and your generation is, is going to make the next enormous change in this, in, for this group because of the fact that they haven't been ignored. Just build on the galvanizing question. Um, I'm Ellen Falls. I'm with the Institute of Politics Fellows Program with Caroline this semester. Um, and so I look at things from a local viewpoint. Can you elaborate on is there a specific piece of legislation in either the House or the Senate um, that people should get behind? What's the takeaway for all of us? Um, or what is the process with the AMA or something to, to move your consensus statement to? a national resolution or something? What are sort of the big institutional things that could be happening, or what pressure could be put on the Obama administration to, to move forward? Uh, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. This medically underserved push that we've been trying the last few years, we've met. I've had a one-on-one -on -one with the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and everybody says, yeah, I get it. I get it. we got to do it. And nobody does anything with it. And the interesting thing is, that we're not asking for any, this is not an, an, an increase in budget. This is just taking whatever you're spending on medically underserved population and just splitting the pie differently. And I can't tell you from early work with Connie Garner and Senator Kennedy's office, and it's like, oh yeah, I get it, we get it, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and every time we get somebody, we testified before the President's Committee uh, on people within, you know, let me see, about four years ago, we were invited to talk to, uh, to the President's Committee of People with Intellectual Disabilities about this issue. And the President's own, all the people on the President's Commission looked at each other and said, what are you talking about? How could it, they not be declared a medically underserved population? This is all we've been hearing about all the time. And they squashed it. They squashed it. Instead of, they voted at that session, they said it's going to be at the forefront of the report that goes to, to President Bush, and instead it was stuck in page like 68, where nobody paid any attention to it. And it was one year to submit it, he has one year to look at it, and then get back to you, and, it, and it's gone again. So, but the, even with the government's own form, I mean, what could be the issue? It's their formula, they created the standards. And now, from what I understand in the political, I mean, you guys have to help us. We're only a bunch of in the trenches working healthcare providers that can't navigate through a system. You know, we can give you the documentation, we can give you the, the, the data. We've been collecting data. We have we have the world Special Olympics has the world's best database. That's why all the governments want to work with us. We have three point five million athletes. You know, there's no more institutions. Everybody's living with their parents, everybody's living in group homes. The governments have no way of knowing the it's called secondary conditions. You know, we know how many people are born with Down syndrome or spina bifida, but, but, uh, but we don't know how many people are born with autism. No government knows because they're diagnosed later. So we have the database of what family, what are the secondary conditions that this population experiences. But we're, it's an invisible population. 54 million Americans with disabilities, 7.5 million Americans with intellectual disabilities are invisible. Invisible. Every time I get something from the American Dental Association, it always focuses on African Americans, Hispanics, underprivileged. They're more worried about 12 Native Americans in some remote Alaskan village than they are about 7.5 million people with intellectual disabilities. It's been nothing but frustration. It just seems to me that, um, that there really, in, in what you've said, there's not the mention of educating parents and family. Because without that education of what's possible for the families, um, you won't have such a strong movement. I mean, it seems to me. Obviously, Sheldon and Lucy educated themselves, but um, that which is so important. Empowering, I agree. Empowering the parent is is very important, but all I parents are so beaten down by the healthcare system. But so beaten down, I can't tell you the countless countless patients that I've encountered 
throughout my career that know they're getting the worst medical care imaginable. I, I can I talk to somebody about a heart condition on, on an obese 40-year-old woman with Down syndrome, and I'll ask, is there a heart problem or not? And they'll say, well, the primary care physician, every time he tries to put a stethoscope on it, she pushes him away, <coughs> and that's it. That's it. And I still get, you know, and I have to, if I have to do patients in the hospital that I can't treat in the office, I always call the primary care physician to say, I'm going to do this case under general anesthesia. I can do anything that you want on this patient while they're under general anesthesia. And sometimes I'll get, well, they don't need anything. I have a 40-year-old woman. When was the last time she ever had a gynecological exam? Never. I can't do it. Don't you think? We, I could do it for you while she's getting her teeth fixed. Don't you think it's important to do it? Well, I don't think she's sexually active. I don't know if it's necessary. What do you say? What, what do you say to somebody? And it's a woman physician that I'm talking to. Would you go 20 years without a gynecological exam? Their parents are so beaten down that they accept any care, even though in their hearts they know it's wrong. Like Bob said, they're lucky to get somebody that's letting their, their daughter in their office. Sorry. You know, on the island of Martha's Vineyard, um, which is obviously, by definition, an insulated place, uh, the level of awareness was very high across the board in that community, and hence acceptance and embracing of Virginia and the campers at Jabberwocky. Um, so how would, how would one translate that into a, b a bigger place with, without borders where you don't run into them every day? I don't know. Um, well, any I thoughts, Lucy? Well, I think that um, the island is is a, a very a very special place, and everybody everybody knows everybody, so to speak. I yeah. mean, and and uh, people with disabilities. There are a lot of things that are working with people with disabilities on the island. I mean, that's that's something that people care about. Um, it is. Uh, it's not easy. I mean, it's not everything is wonderful, and the and the and the medical care. Uh, obviously, at the vineyard now is also connected with your. Um, well, you're talking about such a privileged population it, it, on the vineyard. It's well, not it, a, it, it it's is. It's not even a microscopic capture. Of what's well, going on it, in this but you, it's privileged. Yeah, in, it's, it's the poorest county. It's the poorest county. Yes, yeah, it is poorest. privileged in the summer, right. in the sense. Right. But the not, we well, it's the poorest come. county in Massachusetts. No, I'm not, I've never been. There. Yeah. So I mean I think when you, when I'm talking about um, I'm talking about the island across the way, not just the summer. The summer island, uh, most of those people are not particularly interested. Some are, but but it is a, it is an island, a year-round island where people care do care about that. Yeah. I'm not saying it's perfect. It's yeah. not, but it's it. There is a real, and it, everybody knows um, and connects. Um, it's part of what a community can be like, um, and that's one of the reasons that Virginia uh, was able to live there. Um, and uh, as, as uh, Virginia would, I mean, uh, my daughter would say, when they were living there, they were a little worried when Virginia said she was going to come and live in the vineyard, and they thought, oh my God, you know, we love her dearly, but how much responsibility are we going to have? Because we were still living in Philadelphia. Well, there was. Um, I mean, you, Elizabeth, you can say there was there was a, just a lot of what was going on that she had that, that you didn't have to take care of her yeah. on a regular basis. Well, Dr. Head, uh, uh, I have another point to make, but we, we referred to that as the dignity of risk yes. with Virginia. And that, that is a very important one. Cause very important. The, um, the point I wanted to make is that it, in the 1960s, it goes back to my social movement thing, in the 1960s, it was nonviolent direct action that uh, put the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement uh, in the national consciousness so that it couldn't be ignored. Now, I'm not, I'm not arguing that nonviolent direct action would work in this case, but making the situation much more visible and making uh, people with disabilities uh, much more sympathetic in the public uh, mind is essential, and we've yeah. got to figure out how to do that. Right. Special Olympics has been probably the best Special example, best example ever, ever invented. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
But then you have to connect um, that public awareness of the, the the folks in the Special Olympics, the public awareness of the connection of that to the problems that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gardner, did, did you have something you want to add? We have time for one more question. And you're I, the lucky lady. I, <laughs> I'll try to be brief, although I see I have three minutes. Uh, I'm Lenny Wolf. I'm chair of the board of Camp Jeb Rock. You know, it's just been your sober policy camp. And Virginia was a dear friend, and I'm forever indebted to her because she introduced my son, who was a counselor to his bride. <laughs> and uh, they are, have been married for two years. Um, <laughs> Camp Jabberwocky, Steve alluded to it, is a wonderful example of community support. We could not exist without the support of Martha's Vineyard. Um, Camp Jabberwocky is an eight-week overnight camp. It is run totally by volunteers. Dr. Steve, as he is known, volunteers his time. All of our medical people volunteer their time. And that is so inspiring to me. Uh, I don't have a home on Martha's Vineyard. I rent. Uh, to see these young people and older people volunteering their time to create experiences that are totally memorable. There's really not enough time for me to talk about uh, what I really would like to say, but if you'd like to contact me, um, I'd be happy to share information. We do not, uh, we have um, a wide variety of people with um, special needs, from cerebral palsy to Down syndrome, to spina bifida, multiple disabilities, intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities. And we do not, um, even though we are a volunteer organization, uh, it does cost us over $1,000 a week to run our 14-acre campus and provide uh, a wonderful experience for campers. We do not deny admission for inability to pay. And in fact, we ask parents, if you cannot pay, if you can pay, we expect you to pay. If you cannot, just pay what you can. And uh, families sometimes can afford $25 to $50 a week. Um, but it is, it is just a really inspiring place. We get donations from the community. We, we um, send out two appeal letters to, uh, a year. And we have to raise through um, appeal donations, foundations, tuition about three hundred thousand dollars and we're in the black so. good for you anyway. yes. well, I, I think that's a great way to wrap up I think that uh, uh, since somebody somebody here mentioned uh, Special Olympics I think it's programs like Camp Jab Jabberwocky and Special Olympics that that bring people to the center of the organization we are a volunteer intensive organization as well we actually have 11,000 volunteers that work with us on an annual basis to serve our 12,000 athletes but the volunteers serve both purposes, both the practical and the strategic. The practical aspect is we need them to get the work done. The, the most strategic part of it is it brings them to the center of the organization, gives them an opportunity to interact with people with intellectual disabilities, understand them for what they can do instead of what they can't do, and to appreciate, to appreciate them for the fact that they're more like us than unlike us. Many go home with an with a entirely different perception of people with intellectual disabilities, and if we've done that, and we've put a smile on an athlete's face, we've rung the bell. It's yeah. a great, great, way to, great way to educate people, great way to give people an opportunity to, to become a little more enlightened about the population. Thank you all very, very much. It's 1.30 right on the dot. We appreciate everyone for being here. Thank you to the panelists.